So, ladies and gentlemen, to us and down our environment, Shaw, Erikaj Bishilta. My name is Michael Lonergan. I'm the Deputy uh, Irish Ambassador to the United States. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, on this uh, on this occasion. Uh, my job basically is to introduce our guests of the night and also to uh, ask a few housekeeping rules. The first of which is to please make sure your cell phones are on uh, are on silent. Um, one of the great Irish American stories I always feel here in the United States is uh, Governor Al Smith, the first Irish American Catholic to run for President of the United States. And one day he was challenged by his protege, President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And President Roosevelt said to him, he said, Governor Smith, why do you Irish always answer a question with a question? And he said, do we now, who told you that? Uh, which is answering a question with two questions. Uh, but I think it, ni it nicely frames the kind of conversation and poetry that our guest of honor here tonight has been uh, uh, epitome of. Uh, Sean O'Casey famously said, the great Irish playwright, that all the world is a stage and most of us are deeply unprepared. And that certainly counts for me tonight because unlike my ambassador who should be here and unfortunately is down in St. Louis, but who many of you I know follow on Twitter and on his blog and in posts a daily poem and was indeed a classmate of Williams at University College Cork. I am unfortunately a dull lawyer, a profession of which there are far too many of in this uh, uh, fine city. But I would say that fundamentally we are extremely proud of the fact of our contribution in Ireland to poetry, the literature in general, and William is not just a poet but a a very distinguished short story writer. Ireland is somewhat unique. We have had four Nobel uh, Literature uh, Awards. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, William Butler Yeats, Samuel Beckett, and Seamus Heaney. And the power and contribution of Ireland to English literature or Anglo Irish literature, or how you want to frame it, is quite extraordinary. Uh, up to a couple of years ago, two-thirds of all poetry bought in Britain are poems by Seamus Heaney. It's hard to imagine uh, any one figure dominating uh, uh, literature in the way that, for example, Seamus Heaney uh, dominated um, poetry over the last 20 years. Uh, your former Vice President Joe Biden was extremely fond of quoting Yeats and Heaney and other Irish poets. and. Joe Biden would always say, I don't quote them because they're Irish, I quote them because they're the best. And who am I to argue with the words of Vice President uh, Biden? But I want to say it's a particular pleasure of mine to introduce William Wall. William is a very distinguished Irish poet and uh, short story writer. He was a winner in 2017 of the Drood Hines Literature Award for his short story collection, The Islands. Uh, he's the author of many uh, additional short story collections, four novels, uh, with two forthcoming in 2018 and 2019. He's also been awarded the Doolin Prize for Poetry, the Virginia Faulkner Award, the Sean of Fairlawn Prize, several Writers Weeks Prize, and also the Patrick Kavanagh Award. He's been long listed for the Man Booker Prize and the Manchester Fiction Prize. He's been shortlisted for the Young Minds Book Award, the Irish Books Award, the Raymond Carver Award, the Hennessy Award, and numerous others. He's also the recipient of an Irish Arts Council bursary, and he, is, he has been funded by the Irish Literary, Literature Exchange. So it is a great pleasure on my behalf and on behalf of the Irish Embassy to give a very, very warm welcome to William Wall to the podium. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much, Michael. It's a great pleasure to, to be here, and I'd like to begin by thanking the Irish Embassy and the uh, European Mission to Washington um, and Solace Nua for hosting this, this reading in this uh, beautiful building. Um, and I'd also like to thank the, all the staff of the uh, Abrahamson Centre for looking after us so well. Um, I'm going to read a, a single story today, and uh, 
Um, I'm not, I'm not um, a, a kind and gentle writer, I'm sorry to tell you, on this beautiful evening. Um, and this is a, a story about a, a type of, um, uh, about a very violent event. It's, uh, it's based on, um, very loosely based on real, real, um, real events. I th sometimes think that some countries have signature forms of personal violence. Maybe you could say for America, I'm a stranger here, so I may be off base, but maybe school shootings, perhaps. Um, in Ireland, um, it struck me uh, maybe three or four years ago that um, one of the extraordinary things that Irish men sometimes do is they drive off the top of a pier with their children. Um, and uh, um, it's uh, the thinking behind it, the reasoning behind it, I don't understand. But um, this story comes from uh, my trying to think through one of those events which occurred very near where I live. Um, I think it's uh, reasonably straightforward. There's just one uh, mention in it that perhaps might need a bit of explanation, and that's a song called Don Logue, uh, which perhaps some of you will be familiar with. It's a, a song in what, what we in Ireland call the Shannos, the old style, which is a very ornamented style of um, unaccompanied singing. And um, it's a song. Sure, I'll give you the first verse of it. Not singing it, by the way. Um, the only person who, ex uh, 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 who uh, um, enjoyed my singing was my dog, now alas deceased. Uh, but we got along very well in that regard. Um, uh, it's a hon log ma her har fariga ber me fein latis na den my armad is bega good fairin la enig is margig is in inri grega markel a lapagut. Um, Don log, if you take me away with you across the sea, probably here he was coming, um, you will have uh, uh, presence on a fair day. And a, a rather enigmatic uh, reference, I admit, the, the King of Spain's daughter as your bedmate. Uh, some people translate that as whiskey. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful song. And uh, the central character in the story is a singer. And she sings it at a certain point. So just by way of explanation, so as you, you'll, you'll get the reference. <clears throat> James Casey drove off the top of Rally Pier. His two daughters were in the back seat. The tide here falls out through the islands and away west. It runs at a knot, sometimes a knot and a half at springs. Listen, and you will hear it in the stones. This is the song of lonely places. The car moved a little sideways as it sank, and afterwards great gulps of air escaped, but it made no sound. I know these things, not because I saw them, but because they must have happened. The sky is settling over rally and the hills. It is the colour of limestone, a great cap on the country. Ten miles out, the sky is blue. I heard it on local radio, suicide at Rally Pier. I knew who it was. You cannot see the pier from my house. I got up and put my jeans and sweater on and climbed the hill behind the house through heather and stone to where I could look down. Bees sang in the air, watery sunshine filtered through thin clouds. When I turned after 10 minutes of climbing, the whole bay lay before me. The islands in their stillness, in their pools of stillness. The headlands like crude fingers. Boats out beyond Castle Island, pair trawling a mile or more apart, but connected forever by cables attached to the wings of a giant net. James was on the boats once. He it was who explained all that to me. I saw the police tape on the pier head, a tiny yellowness that was not there before. If he left a note, what did it say? Suddenly the song came into my head, Dona Logue. Even as the first words came, I knew what it meant for me. You took the east from me, and you took the west from me, 
and great is my fear that you took God from me. When the song was finished with me, I walked back down home. I was accustomed to think of it like that, not that I stopped singing, but that the song was finished with me. I made up my bed with fresh sheets and put the soiled ones in the washing machine. I washed out the floor of the bathroom. Why do we do these things when we are bereft? Then I had a shower and put on dark clothes. I got out the bicycle and pumped up the leaking tire. My father has shown me, had shown me how to mend punctures, but I could not remember now. I still have the same puncture repair kit, a tin box, but now I keep hashing it. Then I wheeled the bicycle down to the gate and onto the road and faced the hill to the house where the dead girls lay. They closed the door against me when they saw me turn the bend. Cousins make these decisions. But I leaned my bicycle against the wall and knocked, and then they had to let me in. Perhaps it was inevitable anyway. People around here do not shut their neighbours out. They showed me into the front room where the two girls lay in open coffins. Three older women sat by them. I did not recognise them, aunts most probably. They had their beads in their hands. I did not bless myself. I go to neither church nor chapel, and they all know it. I stood for a long time looking down on the faces. When old people go, death eases their pain and their faces relax into a shapeless wax model of someone very like them. People say they look happy, but mostly they look plastic. But when a child dies, it is the perpetuation of a certain model of perfect beauty. People would say the girls looked like angels. There was no trace of the sea on them, no sign of the panic and fear that bubbled up through the ground up sleeping tablets that their father had fed them for breakfast yesterday morning, according to local radio, his own prescription. He had not been sleeping for months. When I stopped looking, I shook hands with each of the aunts. Nobody said anything. I went out of the room and found the cousins waiting in the corridor. I asked for Helen and was told she was lying down. The doctor was calling regularly all day. She was on tablets for her nerves. She was very low. I was about to ask them to pass on my sympathy when a door opened upstairs. It was Helen herself. She called to know who was there. It's your neighbor, one of the cousins said. She could not bring herself to name me. Helen came unsteadily down the stairs. Her hair was flat and moist. She was wearing the kind of clothes she might have gone to mass in, a formal blouse and a straight grey skirt, but she had no tights on. Her bare feet looked vulnerable and childish. She stepped deliberately, stretching so that at each tread of the stairs she stood on the ball of her foot like a dancer. She came down like someone in a trance. I think we all wondered if she knew who she was coming down for. And if she did, what was she going to say? Coit, she said, is it yourself? Thank you for coming. Her eyes were flat too. There was no light in them. I'm, I'm sorry for your trouble, I said, taking her hand. I held the hand tightly as if the pressure could convey something in itself. Helen shook her head. Why did he do it, she said, even if he went himself, but the girls. Helen, will I make you a cup of tea? One of the coven cousins said that. She was by Helen's side now. She would like to take her arm and lead her into the kitchen. They did not want her going into the front room and starting the wailing and cursing all over again. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, it would terrify you to hear the things she said. And here she was now talking to Coit Dean like nothing happened at all. There was cake and several kinds of bread and honey and tea and coffee and a bottle of the hard stuff and stout and beer. The house was provided against a famine. They'd need it all by and by. This is the way things go at funerals. He always spoke well of you, Helen said. We were childhood sweethearts, I said. He always said you should have trained professionally. He said you had a great voice. I shrugged. 
I heard this kind of thing from time to time. He said, it was a pity what happened to you. I felt my shoulders straighten. I was fond of him, I said, everybody was. He said, you had a terrible bitterness in you. I moved towards the door, but there was a cousin in the way. Excuse me, I said. The cousin did not move. She had her arms folded. She was smiling. He said, you were your own worst enemy. I turned on her. Well, he was wrong there, I said. I have plenty of enemies. Helen Casey closed her eyes. The only thing my husband was wrong about was that he took my two beautiful daughters with him. If he went on his own, nobody would have a word to say against him. But now he cut himself off from everything, even our prayers. If that man is burning in hell, it's all the same to me. I hope he is. He'll never see my girls again, for they're not in hell. And the time will come when you'll join him, and no one will be sorry for that either. One of the cousins crossed herself and muttered under her breath, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. The doorkeeper unfolded her arms suddenly and stepped aside. I opened the door and was taken by surprise to find the priest outside preparing to knock. Oh, he said, excuse me, father. I pushed past him. I noticed that the tire was sinking again. It would need pumping, but I could not do it here. I turned to face away from the house. People say I'm cold, a cold-hearted bitch, some of them say. They say such things. The priest was watching me. He was smiling. The new man in the parish, most likely he did not know who I was. They'd fill him in on the details in the front room with the two dead girls and the old women with their beads. The cousins would know everything. It was how crows always knew there was bread out. First came a single bird, a scout. There was always one. Then they gather. Before long, they're fighting each other over crusts. You can knock fun out of watching them and their comical battles in the backyard. But the minute you put the bread out, one of them turns up to check it out and the others follow soon enough. If you drop dead on your own lawn, they'd be down for your eyes. I swung onto my bicycle and launched myself down the tarmac drive and out onto the road and I turned for the hill down home. But that was not where I was going. I met the car at the place where the road was falling into the valley. There was no question of slipping past. I braked hard and dragged my foot along the road. By the time I stopped, I was by the driver's door and there was a drop of a hundred feet on my left-hand side. He rolled the window down. It was James's brother, Johnny. You'd think the council would shore that up, he said. The crows are gathering, he nodded. The priest was at the door, he nodded again. He looked at me silently for a moment, then he said, he could have asked for help, Coit. You'd have helped him, wouldn't you? I would any day. All he had to do was ask. Johnny, I said, you know very well, I was the last one he turned to, and the last one who could help him. And anyway, there is no help. You could, but you would not. No, I said, I just could not. You know that very well. Do you know what, Coit Dean? I probably do, Johnny. He looked at me, frustrated. You were always the same. You were too sharp for around here. I shrugged. <coughs> My brother James, he said, you destroyed him. He destroyed himself. I didn't drive him down to the pier. Why did he do it if not for you? You took him. You took him and you wouldn't keep him and then you left him. Why else would he do it? I got my foot on the pedal and faced down the hill. Spite, I said. He was always spiteful, like a spoiled child. I launched myself forward and went clear of the car. In a moment, I was past the subsiding section. Fuchsia speckled the roadsides with their first, first bloody skirts. In the valley, the last of the white thorn blossom the river at the very bottom gleaming like concrete in a field of bog iris. And ahead was the bay and its islands and the vast intolerant ocean. I chained the bicycle to the stop sign outside the funeral home. The street was a long one that ran into a steep hill. 
the funeral home, the graveyard and the church were all at the top of the hill so that the dead could look down on the town. And the townspeople, when they looked up from the pavement, saw death looming like a public monument to their future. People joked that it was the only town in Ireland where you had to climb up to your grave. To make matters worse, the funeral home was owned by the Hill family. There were several hills in the parish, and naturally, the funeral home was called the Hilton. They say that the only people making money out of the economic crash were accountants and funeral directors. Even the bankrupt had to be buried by somebody. At the door, in a plastic frame, was a poster with a picture of an anorexic bonsai plant and the words, our promise to you, phone any time, day or night, you will never get an answering machine. Funeral homes are always cold. There were pine benches in lines like a church. They had been varnished recently and there was that heady smell. It reminded me of my father's boat, the wheelhouse brightwork newly touched up. It was the smell of childhood. James Casey lay in a plain wooden box at the top of the room. I could see immediately that the brass handles were fake. Someone had examined a funeral menu and ticked cheap. I went to look down on him. I thought I had nothing to say, but when I was there, I had plenty. You stupid bastard, I said. You stupid, murdering bastard. There was more like that. I surprised myself with the flow of anger, the damn burst of fury. After a time, I stopped because I was afraid I was going to attack the corpse. And then I thought I might have been shouting. No one came. Perhaps funeral directors and their secretaries are used to angry mourners. I stepped back and found my calf touching a bench. I sat down. Sat down. They'll all blame me, I told him. They already blame me. Then I cried. James Casey looked tranquil and unperturbed. In real life, he was never like that. After a time, I got up. I looked down at him. His eyes were stitched closed because when he was pulled from the sodden car, of course, they were open. They are not very expert in our part of the world. I could see the stitches here and there. The funeral director knows from experience that the eyes of dead people do not express emotion, but he knows that his clients would see fear in them. Nobody wants to look a dead man in the eye. It's bad for business. Fuck you, I said. I turned on my heel and walked out. A tiny sigh escaped when I closed the door, like the seal opening on an airtight jar. My bicycle lay on the ground in its chains. They knifed the tires while I was with James. I was not going to give them the satisfaction of watching me wheel it down the street. I was going to leave it where I found it. Do not slouch, my mother used to say. Stand up straight, put your shoulders back. But I slouched just the same. How many years since I first loved James Casey? I pulled my shoulders back, but I kept my eyes on the ground. The thought that I had done something unforgivable was always there in the dark. Things come back in the long run the way lost things are revealed by the lowest tides, old shipwrecks, old pots, the ruined moorings that once held steadfastly to trawlers or pleasure boats. There are no secrets around here. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, that was cheerful. Uh, I want to, I'm John Waters. I'm a professor of Irish studies at NYU at Glucksman Ireland House. And uh, I was utterly delighted when the University of Pittsburgh Press got in touch to ask if I would uh, come and speak with Bill about this amazing book. First thing, can you see it? Isn't it beautiful? It's a beautiful book. It's beautifully made. It's beautifully produced, it's solidly made, and it's beautifully written, and it's available for sale. So don't leave without it. Um, that's the first thing, right? You've got to take the book away with you. Uh, but we heard, we, uh, we heard it. I'm glad you read that piece. It's a, it's a great, 
a sample of, of um, some of the sculpting and shaping that you do in your sentences, Bill, but it's also, it stands outside in a way from the other uh, five of the six fictions. And so if I can be useful for perhaps for those of you who are going to go on to read this, and I know every single one of you is going to go on to read this book, um, I, I might ask how, first about the voice. Uh, these are all women in this book. These are all told from the point of view of women. And if I may you know, venture it out, I'd say, this is actually a feminist novel or feminist fictions. Um, there's strong women in the book. Uh, and so I wonder if you might want to say a word about that. Is, was, was there a sense of rocks under the sea of writing about, uh, about in a woman's voice? Uh, did it take a while? Or? Um, I've written, I think at this stage, um, two novels in a woman's voice. Um, and some of my stories outside of this collection are also written in a, women, in a woman's voice. Um, and I've, I've often puzzled about why. I mean, I'm aware of uh, cultural appropriation and you know, the, the, the discourse around all that. Uh, and it, it, uh, it has given me pause for thought. I don't really know why. But I think one of the reasons is because in the beginning, uh, when it, my first novel, uh, not exactly in a woman's voice, it's third person narrative, but it, it does focus on a, on a woman's experience. And uh, initially, um, I, I have to say, I have a horror of sentimentality. Um, you probably noticed that in the story, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, um, I, I, I think I'm drawn to sentimentality, I should say, um, and uh, um, I, I wanted to avoid it in my writing. And as a result of that, I think my initial move to, to actually place a woman at the center of the book was a distancing technique, um, a, a way of maintaining some level of objectivity, maybe, in relation to it. Um, but I, I'm also married to a feminist, uh, a very strong um, uh, feminist, uh, and a, a long-standing feminist. And um, I, I feel quite assured um, uh, writing about women, because I know that um, if I step out of line, somebody will wrap me on the knuckles. <laughs> uh, very hard as well. So, uh, and, and in fact, Liz, uh, who, who's up there in the audience, is my is my first reader, and I think my best reader. And um, I, I, I find that uh, her advice in that regard is always, uh, it has to be listened to. Uh, I might add, by the way, that it's very painful sometimes. Uh, for example, in, in writing one of my novels, uh, I had, uh, I think, about 60,000 words. Most of my novels come out at between 70 and 80,000 words. So 60,000 words is well on its way to being a full novel. And uh, at that stage, I'm confident enough to, to give it to Liz to read. And she came back and she said, you need to cut 40,000 words. So that was a difficult week, month, <laughs> maybe. Um, but, you know, she was right. So uh, in that regard, you know, uh, as regards um, writing about women, uh, on, on the one hand, I always feel that um, uh, I, I have the best advice I could possibly have about it. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, it is for me a way of actually keeping myself out of the book um, uh, as a kind of a distancing technique. And I think that's, that's part of it, really, you know. Uh, but uh, one other point as well, I mean, I think uh, I'm preaching, I'm sure, to the converted here, but, uh, you know, writers are drawn, as Frank O'Connor said, to s submerged populations is the phrase that he used. Um, uh, we're talking about um, outsiders to power, to society. That's really where writers go for work. And uh, if you were to look at um, uh, modern society, particularly in Ireland, um, women are... Uh, or have been, less so now, I'm glad to say, but have been the submerged population par excellence in Ireland for uh, many, many years. So um, it's, it's a natural um, inclination uh, in me to want to write about, uh, about people who find themselves in those positions where you know, power has always fascinated me and uh, people who are excluded from, have been in the past excluded from power. So that's... Um, There's a paradox there, which is that Power is one thing, but strength is another. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. The women, the women in these stories are strong, mm. and their voices are strong. The, 
the style, and, and this partly there's a, there are some craft questions I'd love to ask you just about uh, modulating between description, descriptive thought and speech without quotation marks. There's no quotation marks yeah. in the book. There's a Joyce uh, reader, Joyce descendant here about thinking about language on the text and on the page. But, um, but in terms of the voice and the perspective of the, of the women in all of these fictions, they're very strong. There's, um, and I, th I think that, that certainly that has something to do with the theme of islands mm -hmm. in the book. Mm -hmm. um, you're not from an island. Well, unless you count Ireland. Unless you count Ireland, <laughs> <laughs> which you must. I'm not from an island, but I have spent a lot of time on islands. Both, yeah. I mean, they, just to fill you in a little in the background, the, the stories are set on three islands. Um, and there are originally three islands, three characters in the story, each of whom is an island, you know. Uh, I, I thought of it that way. Um, and uh, the islands are, there's a little island quite near where we're going to visit when you come over in the summer, um, uh, uh, called uh, Castle Island, which I name in the story. Um, it's an uninhabited island. It was inhabited until about the time of the Great Irish Famine in the 1840s. Uh, but now the houses still remain. Um, no, no roofs and so on, but the, the, the walls of the houses are there. And that's the first island where the story begins. Um, the second island is in England, on the south coast of England, the Isle of Wight, where an aunt of mine who married an Englishman uh, emigrated for, for work in the uh, 50s. Um, she lived there, and I used to spend quite a bit of my summer holidays there when I was a teenager. And she was kind of like a second mother to me. And then the third island is a, a little island in the Bay of Naples called Proshida, where we've spent quite a bit of time. We, we like Italy a lot. And um, uh, Proshida is uh, uh, the direct opposite, really, of the the uh, Irish island in that it's the most densely populated urban area in Europe, rural area, I beg your pardon, in Europe. Uh, I often think you could start at the port, climb onto somebody's roof, cross the island from roof to roof without touching the ground. It's that densely populated. So, um, so islands are, are very, very strong in it, you know. Um, as regards the, the women being strong, yes, um, there are, are essentially two female characters uh, in the stories, and um, they are both really strong in their own ways, in quite different ways, I think. Um, one is uh, one becomes a, a psychiatrist, psychologist, I should say. Um, I always think of her uh, as a follower of Lacan, um, because uh, I, my my son, who um, is a postmodernist, I, I say under my breath and. <laughs> I have to admit, uh, had friends who still who studied Lacan. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, person she is. And then the other is a geologist. And um, uh, one of the things that I loved about the geologist character is it gave me the opportunity to write about stones, uh, which I, I find fascinating. And um, Ireland is, well, every place, every place is full of stones, I suppose. But particularly if you go to, if you should ever travel to West Cork or Kerry or Connemara, uh, Donegal, the Iron Islands, the stones are what are, what are going to strike you. I, w I was I was led. I've got a few marks, and I was just thinking of Tim Robinson. Yeah, the, Tim and Robinson. A number of points yeah. that Tim Tim is the great poet of the stones of Ireland. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah. one of our great prose stylists, really. In, in and a, map a maker. Tradition. And a map maker. And yeah, a, and a great intellect and and a, yeah. a, a amazing achievement. And I I found myself really thinking about some of the wonderful passages of the sculpting. Yeah. of the island of well, Ireland uh, that Tim manages, in, yeah. particularly in his Connemara trilogy. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but the, the islands also give you this theme about isolation, and it, particularly in the first story. So there's a family uh, that has a, a, a writer who is, uh, I think, easily described perhaps as a leftist patriarch of sort, perhaps? Uh, well, I think work? of him as, green, as a green patriarch a green rather than patriarch. leftist. I, uh, yeah, patriarch. I mean, he yeah. is yeah. kind of yeah. left-wing as well, but yeah. 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 Um, but this is, a, this is a painful story about disintegration and a kind of a fractured family and, and uh, a sort of tragic family, but also set again in a, in a place where the austerity <coughs> of, of setting is, is sort of masterfully done. I had no idea how much uh, shape the stories would acquire 
together. So the story that you read is in some ways tethered to the others through the mm. character of James Casey, yep. who's mentioned in the first story. And I just wonder if, about, if you could say a word or two, Bill, about writing a short story collection. These are individual units, but they, uh, and they touch each other. Mm -hmm. Five of the six are much more strongly connected. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's space and air and light in between them. And I wonder mm -hmm. uh, just about the craft and the structuring of the book, if, if you could say a word or two about just uh, how, how did you do that? Uh, how, OK. Yeah. Well, this, this may sound a bit peculiar now, but um, I, I think of it as an experiment in form because uh, this book was written simultaneously with a novel, uh, which follows the same characters and has shares a lot of the material. Um, so in some ways, uh, this collection of stories is a novel without the connecting parts. Um, again, uh, coming back to, to Frank O'Connor, he said that um, uh, a short story is a novel without a hero. Um, and in, in many ways, uh, in, in kind of writing these stories, uh, I was conscious of the idea that the, the arc of a novel is going to be missing. So uh, what you need to do, uh, what I needed to do, was to create a, a set of stories um, which linked together without those connecting pieces that, um, that a novel would give, um, but which also uh, belong together in an integral way. Um, and it was, a, it was an extremely difficult, um, I found it extremely difficult to do. Uh, it's, it's in a way, it's not like a standard set of connecting stories. You know, I mean, a, a set of connecting stories is a very uh, common device now. Um, I often think that uh, writers beginning their career uh, see it as a way of writing a novel without actually undertaking the huge undertaking that is a novel, you know? I mean, a novel is anywhere between a year and 10 years of your life um, in which you, you live inside in a world that you've created yourself and you abandon reality for a bit, you know? Um, and, and so this was a, I, I think this is a way of avoiding doing that. You can write individual pieces, but it's still not that entire work, you know? Um, so it's not really like that. It's not, um, uh, it, it's, the stories are in some ways less connected than a connected set of fiction. And in other ways, they are more connected. Um, there are a, a couple of very short stories in it, for example, which I should probably have read. Um, <laughs> might have been easier on you, um, which uh, are, are just dropped in, almost as if they were. Uh, in fact, I often wonder if a reader can make the connections between them. And then there's this story, which I've just read, which is, it is an outlier, I have to admit, to the collection in general. But it shares the same atmosphere, the same landscape. Um, it shares, uh, there are some references, which John has pointed out, to other stories. Um, I think of it as being the experience of the islands, because when when they look out, when she looks out from, uh, when she goes up on the hill to look out, what she's looking at is the island where the first story takes place. Um, uh, so it shares so much of the other stories. But here's uh, what I think is maybe the strangest thing about it. That actually was almost a novel. There are another, it's maybe 4,000 words long, 3,000 words long. There are another 40,000 words on my laptop. So I know all the backstory, you know, <laughs> and I never got to tell you. Um, but uh, there are another 40,000 words, which um, uh, I cut back and cut back and cut back, cut back until I reached a short story. Um, and that's, in a way, I think that may be why uh, it, it feels so much like a, an outlier. It's, it's, there's the, again, the geology, the idea of where, in a way, everything that's not a sorry, the, the idea of the geological shaping of something, wearing away everything that's not essential, yeah. so that really we only have exactly what we need to have, 
it seems to me, is one of the distinguishing marks of, of the fictions that you've written. Um, when we met earlier, one of the first things I, I thought to ask Bill was, uh, I wonder if Grace's day, which is Grace is the first of the, of the narrators of the two women in the first story, I wonder if it could be a novel, which is how I found out that in fact he'd written a novel alongside of this, which is quite an extraordinary thing. Uh, August publication? It's, it's due to be published in August, so wow. maybe I'll come back next year. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll read this and you'll have a fantastic anticipation. But another thing I wanted to say that, that there's a fantastic arc to this collection of six fictions in that the first five, first four sentences of the first story reappear in a marvelously in brilliant structural innovation and structural satisfying conclusion to the book. Um, it's, it's remarkable how, the, how it ends and how it redeems something. And part of what it redeems to me, it, uh, as the way I want to think about this a little bit, is that you're interested here partly in artistic failure or, an, or the, the, the infliction on the family or the, the, uh, the loved ones of an artist. Because there's the, there is a negative portrait of the artist submerged in the book through the father figure. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder, um, again, I'm not sure what you, what you may want to or may or not want to say much about that, but, <clears throat> but it's quite interesting that there's a powerful writing, writer figure who's the father who leaves this family on the island and goes off to be a successful uh, speaker and writer and, and uh, public figure while his family are living a life that he writes about. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, often my books are, they begin with um, uh, anger maybe at, at something. And uh, this began really when the Irish Green Party, which I used to vote for, um, joined a right-wing coalition. And um, uh, in the process, wiped itself out, in effect, uh, because nobody would vote for them afterwards. Um, I mean, you don't vote for a Green Party so they can join a party that imposes austerity on people, you know? Um, and, uh, and this anger, uh, I mean, I'm well aware that Green Parties around the world are incredibly progressive. Uh, the Green Party in England, for example, is a fantastic party, you know? I would like to be able to vote for it, except that we did fight a war against the English, so we didn't have to vote for people in England. Um, uh, so uh, it, it kind of began with that, and this, this uh, father in, in the book is, um, is, is uh, a green um, politician. And again, I'd like to say, by the way, I, I support the green agenda in general, you know. Uh, he's, a, he's a green politician who abandons, gradually abandons everything worthwhile about being green. Um, funnily enough, he's based on an English um, uh, environmental writer who uh, had a, a huge uh, impact on me, a man I admired enormously, and uh, indeed um, also on um, Rachel Carson, uh, the American green writer, you know, Silent Spring and those books. The, the sea, is it The Sea Around Us, it's called, I, I think is the other book. Um, but in a negative sense, in, in the sense that, you know, he abandons what these people actually believed in. Um, uh, he's an absent father. So here's your psychologist is bound to, she was bound to become a psychologist really when you think about it, you know, the absent father, the, the um, uh, you know, she, she says at one point, uh, there were three islands and there were youth, childhood and age, and I searched for my father in every one. Um, and uh, again, that, those three islands, by the way, are, uh, are a, a, a myth mythological connection in Ireland, you know, Yeats wrote about them. Um, and the, the island of youth is the most famous one, Tiernan Og. Um, so he's the, he's the absent father. Uh, he's a, a, a political failure. Um, he's a, a, a political renegade. Um, and uh, he's absent from the book almost completely until the very last story, which is the confrontation between the two daughters, well, one daughter in particular, and uh, and him, I, and I won't say any more about that because that's the end. Yeah, <laughs> I, I should note that you have a son named Oshin. I do, um, yeah. which <laughs> circles around the myth of the wanderings of Oshin. Oshin, Oshin went to Tiernanog, <laughs> the island of youth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
uh, shift to questions. Uh, we'll shift to questions uh, in a moment, but but let me let me ask just a, a sort of more background question, Bill. <clears throat> when did you start writing? And did you st you've written poetry and fiction, hmm. and uh, do you do you move back and forth fluidly between the two? You're, you're, I have to say, it's clear to me that you would write poetry from the way, from the clean, the cleanliness. The there's a there's a sort of limpid quality of to the prose that's very clean. There's not much, um, uh, there's no excess. I can't find excess uh, in the writing. So, did you did you start out as a poet or as a fiction writer? And have you? Yeah, I started writing when I was 12 years of age. Um, at least that's the earliest time I can I can pin it down. And I, I contracted at 12 years of age a disease called Stills disease, which is a form of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which is a bastard of a disease, I can tell you. Uh, I mean, I had, a, I had a very happy childhood, but in another way, I had a terrible childhood, uh, in and out of hospital and constantly ill and in pain and so on. And uh, the, when I contracted it first, I was a year uh, at home, out of school, and my parents knew I liked reading, and they fed me books. And uh, at some point in that year, um, I began to write my own stories and poems. Um, and uh, my mother, who was another very strong woman, um, at 15, collected all of my stories and poems together. By that stage, I had a typewriter which was kind of unusual uh, in Ireland in the 1960s, you know, 90, early, late 1960s. Um, but my aunt, who was a nurse, this aunt who lived in England, said that, you know, his, ha his fingers will, his hands will turn into claws. That's what happened in those days to people with arthritis. And you finished up in a wheelchair pretty quickly as well, a lot of the time. And uh, so she said, buy him a typewriter because he likes writing. And the right, the, that will keep his, finger, his hands from turning into claws. It'll be an exercise. So I, I began typing. My mother collected it all, and she sent it off to an Irish writer called John B. Keane, who was a playwright from Listowel. And uh, he, they had just founded um, an event called the uh, Listowel Writers' Week, and she heard him interviewed on the radio. So she sent it off to him. And by return of post, I had a, a check for 10 pounds. Now, this is 1970, probably. 10 pounds was a fortune to a child, you know? Um, and uh, the letter said that, um, uh, you know, I should keep writing, and that this was a, a new literary prize that he and a friend had just founded. <laughs> and uh, and I, I had just won it. And it, I don't think it was ever awarded again, or if it was, <laughs> they kept it a good secret, you know? Uh, and um, uh, you can imagine, I was uh, 15 at that stage. You can imagine what that meant to a 15-year-old, you know? Especially as I was a, a lonely, isolated, sick child, you know? Uh, it, it meant, um, it meant a, a very great deal. Um, and so at that stage, uh, I wrote, I, I recently had to, to find that manuscript again for, to write something about it. And uh, I found it in my parents' papers in the attic. And uh, I, I discovered that I, there were about 250 poems in the manuscript, which I had written between the age of 12 and 15, most of which were absolute crap, I have to say. You know, you can imagine. Um, they were poems about girls that I loved from a, a distance of half a mile, you know. Um, poems about uh, all sorts of political stuff and um, uh, also some poems that I think uh, were the beginning of real writing, maybe 10 or 15 poems out of that, that I could see the beginning of, of, uh, of, of writing in them, you know? And there were also, uh, I think, 15 stories or thereabouts. And the stories were the hardest part because it was physically painful to write. Um, and that, after that, uh, I mainly wrote poetry for many years until the invention of the word processor. And I remember I was a teacher. I remember being at an event where we were introduced to computers. And the guy said, uh, well, you know, you can do spreadsheets, zero interest. You can do databases, zero interest for me, you know. And there's this thing called a word processor, which we think might be big, you know. And I, I thought, holy shit, I'm going to write a novel on that, you know. 
And that's when I began to write longer fiction and when I started writing novels. Um, so uh, in a way, really, poetry is in my blood and novels are in my bones. That's what it comes down to. That's terrific. I'm, I'm so glad I asked that because uh, <laughs> I'm, by, by, a, by a marvelous coincidence, I don't know how many in the audience will have read this, on Monday night, uh, my graduate seminar on philosophical comedy and Irish writing, I'm teaching letters to an Irish parish priest <laughs> by, by John B. John Keen. B. Keen. And yeah. John B. Keen, you know, he, he, deserves, he deserves to be back in, in circulation yeah. and in a conversation because he's, he's yeah. a remarkable character. But the, yeah. that's, a, that's a fantastic story about, uh, about him lighting you up from far away in, in that yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, uh, I wonder, sh shall we shift to questions? Hi, my name is Cole Salone. I'm a student here at NYU. Um, and I'm just, I'm really interested in Irish history, um, in particular modern history and the Troubles. Um, I don't know much about it, um, so I can't ask anything specific, but I was just interested in how that kind of social and cultural phenomenon uh, influenced your writing and kind of your, your outlook. Um, <clears throat> the Troubles in the North of Ireland, you mean, yeah. Um, it's the other end of the island, um, and uh, the, you know the uh, the north of Ireland has its own writers, and we, I was mentioned earlier the concept of cultural appropriation. I, I feel um, I, I never have written directly about the troubles, and you know the old adage is write what you know, which I partly agree with, um, but. I certainly don't think I, I would be in any way um, qualified to write directly about the Troubles. I'd be put straight on it very quickly by my friends from the North. Um, uh, I think uh, it's, I mean, I know the history um, and I've read a great deal about it, um, but uh, it, it isn't in, in my field of writing. Uh, but for an Irish person of my age, uh, the Troubles is a, uh, I mean, the two sets of Troubles, the 1916 uh, to 1923, say, uh, and then 1967, 68 onwards, uh, are two enormous um, uh, events, if you like, in our consciousness, you know. Um, two huge traumas. Um, the, the North... Uh, it, it was very complex. I have friends, for example, uh, who were part of the people like Eamon McCann. I'm sure you may have met Eamon McCann. People who were part of um, of the civil rights movement before the troubles itself began, you know, and which took their inspiration, by the way, from Martin Luther King and civil rights here. Um, uh, and um, I have friends who were members of the Provisional IRA. And uh, I have friends on the other side as well. Um, so we're talking about uh, uh, a series of events of incredible complexity. Um, and uh, definitely a Southern writer, I was going to say would, would be shot. But you know, we, we say that um, casually, they'd shoot you for saying that. You know, uh, They wouldn't actually shoot me for saying it. But you know, uh, I, I definitely couldn't tread on that territory. Um, I, w I would feel very, very, very much out of my depth. Uh, but yeah, hugely, hugely important. And uh, by the way, um, we were talking about history earlier, and you were talking about history now. Um, I, I would say that uh, history in Ireland was reshaped very, very powerfully by the Troubles, because I, I remember very well in 1966, which was the 50th anniversary of the 1916 rebellion. Um, uh, in my school, every school in Ireland, um, read the Proclamation of Independence on the anniversary of the day in which the proclamation was read. And I was selected to read it in Irish because my Irish was best in our school. I learned it by heart. And then this guy from the west of Ireland came to the school and his Irish was better. And he got the job. And I ended up reading it in English. And I never forgave him. So much so that I've forgotten his name Coming back to psychology again, I've repressed him. Um, but uh, um, 
we were imbued by uh, uh, with, with a sense of nationalist fervor, um, which was uh, completely uh, undermined by the outbreak of the Troubles. And in fact, I think history began to be rewritten as a result of that. It became impossible, really, uh, to write about the events of the War of Independence in the same way as we did before. It's coming back again now because, I mean, I think they were heroes, the people who fought the War of Independence. But for a long time, revisionism um, kind of churned it and brought out all the stories because there are, of course, in every, every war, there are other stories as well. So I think it had a very profound effect in Ireland. Something to follow up on that just a little bit, not about the North per se, but, but uh, to shift directions a little bit, Bill. Uh, it, thinking about this book, but also about the other work you've done um, and your work as a translator, you're, it seems to me, very much a, a European writer. Yeah. And, uh, and the way that your imagination works and your... Um, certainly your, your public intellectual sort of presence as a, as a European writer. I wonder when did you start to shift or pivot toward continental Europe in your, your reading and your thinking? And, and if you could say a word about your work as a translator, because it's, I think, it's, yeah. I think it's, it's buried in, in your fiction in a way. But. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I began to, to think seriously about Europe in my late teens when I started to read existentialism really was the thing, you know. Um, actually, I discovered subsequently that postmodernism was already the thing at that stage, but it hadn't come to Ireland, you know. Um, so I was too late for postmodernism. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, I began to read a French existentialism particularly, and uh, I became very interested in that. And uh, I, um, let's say, attempted to learn French. Um, and w with very limited success. Uh, but I, I became very interested in continental Europe. And then ultimately, I became interested in, in Italian, uh, in learning Italian, and in ultimately in translating from Italian. And uh, indeed, uh, with Italian literature. And I, I, I do think of myself, I have to admit, as uh, being more closely related to Italian writers that I admire. And you know, you talk about the uh, the political side of things. Uh, in Ireland, it's not easy to be a political writer. It's kind of looked down on. Not looked down on, it's marginalized, maybe, is a better word. Uh, whereas in continental Europe, um, you can be as political as you want to be. Um, and um, I think that interest in the continent led me ultimately to Italy and uh, led me to uh, to read people like Antonio Gramsci, and then ultimately Pasolini, Calvino, you know, all, all the people that you could imagine. And um, that I, I had, by then I had fallen in love with Italy, and um, it was a natural step to begin, to begin translating. But I always translated. I, tr I translated from Irish as a, a teenager. And uh, when I began to study Latin at school, I translated from Latin badly, um, or at least so my Latin teacher always said. Uh, but I, I, I still occasionally look back and try to work on Latin with the aid of a grammar. Um, uh, so translation has always been there. I think, you know, Irish people uh, uh, learn Irish from a very early age. And we have a love-hate relationship with the language by and large. Uh, I love it. Uh, but some people, you know, because it's obligatory in the school, compulsory in the school. Some people hate it. Um, but it's still there in the consciousness, and it's there in our language. Um, you know, I'm sure that Irish doesn't have a yes and a no. You can't say yes in Irish. Um, so people tend to answer things with a full sentence, you know? Um, uh, are you, uh, you know, do, do you have a hat? I do. An English person would say yes. An Irish person would say I do, or I have, more likely, uh, because Irish uh, always answers with a verb. It doesn't answer with a, a yes or a no. So that's there. I mean, that's a tiny example, but it's there in our consciousness always. The Irish language is there in the background in the way we speak English, and um, for some of us, it's a 
it's a kind of a reasonably living thing. Um, so translation is a natural step for somebody who begins learning a, a second language at four years of age. Um, translation, one thinks in terms of translation. Even now when I learn Italian, when I, when I speak Italian, I often find myself fitting the grammatical structures together because they're very similar. Irish grammar is based on Latin as well. Um, and I, I, you know, you can you can fit the two together. I don't know if that's answered your question, John. I'm just no, rambling at this stage. That's you know? fine. But it's it's an important it's an important thing to get about translation in Ireland. Almost every major literary figure in Ireland has has done some translation. It's mm -hmm. so it's important to bring it up. So, oh, sorry. There's, I think um, there's. I don't think I need the microphone. I think they'll be okay. Yeah, an Irish woman. She's very strong. Congratulations. Uh, she, would have, she would have loved to be here tonight, uh, but she was traveling for work. And um, my sister-in-law is Olivia Mitchell. She's another very strong woman in Ireland, recently retired from the parliament. And uh, it intrigued me when you said the book is in the voice of a woman. Mm. And, and to me, I mean, that would be challenging here in America, but from what I've met the women in Ireland, that would even be more of a challenge. So what got you to that point where you thought that was the right voice and how did, I mean, that's a, a great obstacle. Um, you know, I don't really know where books come from. Um, I don't know what, how a book gets into my head. Um, I, I never teach creative writing, for example, because I don't know how to do it myself. Um, and this book began with a sentence. There were three islands. That's where it began, even though it's not the beginning, I think, anymore, is it? I'm not sure. But uh, that's, that was the beginning of the book originally. There were three islands, and they were youth, childhood, and age. And then the next line was, and I followed my father through every one. And it occurred to me, when I had written that down, for some strange reason, that that had to be a woman. And that's where it began. It literally began with, uh, very often for me, any, everything begins, uh, everything I write begins usually with a, a phrase or a sentence which also contains a voice. I know when I have that voice that I have a possible story or book. And in this case, I was absolutely certain, without any, I mean, there's nothing in that sentence that says it has to be a woman. But I was absolutely certain that that voice was a woman's voice. Why? I don't know. The ancients used to say, they used to talk about in, in, inspire, you know, to breathe in, uh, that the gods breathed it into your head while you were asleep at night. I think they were right. Thank you so much. I'm I mean, Jolson, and I teach at Georgetown University, one of those other universities. <laughs> um, so I have two interrelated questions. You wrote so beautifully and in a very subtle way about Catholicism in the family. You spoke, I believe it was two or three times, you mentioned the women having the beads and so forth. Mm. And uh, Catholicism in Ireland is changing as we speak. And then there are the, um, the, the immigrants who are coming, who have come over the last 20, 25 years, mm -hmm. some from Europe, some from Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, mm -hmm. some from the Middle East, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And they're bringing a new voice, mm -hmm. and in some way, in some cases, different religions. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could imagine, say, 10 years from now, if not sooner, how what some think of as the singular voice of Irish literature mm -hmm. will be different. Mm -hmm. So what, um, what new thinking and grace and language will be brought um, yeah. by this different population and some different religions? Yeah. I think that's very exciting, what you did, the process you're describing there. Um, uh, you know, in historical terms, Ireland has been a net exporter of people since at least the Great Famine. And um, Emigration has, in some ways, defined parts of the Irish countryside. Um, and to a certain extent, helped to define parts of America and Britain and Australia and Canada and so on. Um, now the process is reversing. And that's a healthy sign, because immigrants can't only come to a country when there's work. Um, so 
uh, it means uh, that the Irish economy is at long last beginning to um, to be sufficient to to host other people you know um, uh, I think um, so far there has not been a major uh, writer from that uh, incoming uh, migration, but it has to happen, it will happen. Uh, there are some poets um, who are beginning to, to write, and I think, I would think anyway that um, uh, poetry is a, a natural starting point for uh, a literature, um, for, for a, a literature of incoming peoples, you know, um, because the initial experience of getting to Europe and to Ireland is an odyssey, you know. Um, it's, uh, it's um, uh, you know, to, to have passed those uh, experiences really calls for poetry. So I, I would think, um, I would think the first voices that we will hear will be poets of various kinds. And um, I think sooner or later there will be a novel of that migration the sooner the better. Um, I think it'll enrich Irish culture enormously. Um, you know, we've been, uh, the last big influx of, um, of migrants that we had was uh, around the time of Oliver Cromwell. It didn't go well. Um, and uh, <laughs> it has caused us problems. We are coming to terms with it now, uh, three or 400 years later. Uh, but um, uh, I think uh, we're better prepared this time, and uh, I think it's, I think it will go well, and I think we will have literature soon. And uh, by the way, in the case of religion, yes, Catholicism has suffered very badly in Ireland um, uh, for its own fault, really, when you think of the scandals that have struck the church. Um, and uh, I, I think it's a much diminished force. And um, as we speak, we're in the process of a major referendum, um, which I, I hope will be carried. Um, but uh, the church doesn't want it to be carried. And um, we'll, we'll have to see about it. But then they didn't want to see the equal marriage referendum carried either. But that was carried by a massive majority. So the peop Ireland is changing very dramatically. Probably because I'm an American, I sit here and I meet a lot of Irish people that come over, and of course I'm very American-centric because of that. What was intriguing to me was that you hadn't been to the United States at, before, basically. Mm -hmm. And I you know, ascertained your age and things like that. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. And <laughs> I, the second thing I thought, and maybe we even had this conversation, is, wow, what, a, what an interesting opportunity. And I don't know, maybe you haven't had enough of a trip yet, but it, it's like I was just kind of thought, do you think you might anything about your just coming to this other place? Um, You're not going to see just one place. Yeah. I, one of the problems I have with writing is that I can never write about a place until I've practically lived there. Um, I couldn't bring myself... Uh, I, th I think I'm 10 years now trying to write something about Italy. And while the last story in this book, well, there's two stories in the book that are set in Italy. Um, and I'm now writing a novel, uh, or a novella probably, which is completely set in Italy. So it has taken me, uh, well, really 20 years to feel comfortable enough to, to write about a place. Um, I think that's because I lived all my life in Ireland, apart from holidays, you know. Um, and I, I've come to absorb places. I, I've come to absorb places very slowly, you know. Uh, I also dislike that sort of tourist writing, you know, that you occasionally get where a writer goes on holidays to a place for two weeks and suddenly their next book is set there. You know, I, I just don't think that's really authentic. Um, I could see myself setting stories here in America. I couldn't see myself setting a novel here. Uh, but I, I also write a set of things that really have never been published. 
um, kind of flash fiction, very, very short pieces. I call them Q pieces because the central character is a pain in the ass whose, na whose only name is Q, the letter Q. Uh, it's short for Quasimodo or Quasimodo. Um, and uh, he's a, he, he has, you know, he's really a, a social critic of the lowest order, you know. And uh, so I can see myself writing Q pieces because I write them wherever I go, wherever I travel, I write those, you know. Um, and I could see a story set here, but certainly not a novel anyway. I wouldn't be so presumptuous as to write about another culture that I didn't really understand very well. Um, my first trip here was, I, I, I had been to Canada before. Um, I don't know if that counts. <laughs> but uh, my first trip was to Pittsburgh. And, uh, uh, and uh, I, 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 I boasted all the way around Pittsburgh that I was the only person I knew whose first trip to America had been to Pittsburgh. Um, uh, Irish people go to New York, you know, or they go to Washington, or they don't go to Pittsburgh. They might have gone to Pittsburgh in the 19th century, but, you know, nowadays they, they tend not to. So, um, but I, I've really enjoyed my, I enjoyed my two weeks here last year, last autumn. And so far I'm enjoying this very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a great country, a very interesting country. Of course, I know the literature and the music. <laughs> You're almost as shy as an Irish audience. <laughs> well, there is one more thing that we need to do, which is I need to ask you to thank Bill Wall for coming here and for speaking so uh, so wonderfully about his work. Thanks, Bill. Thank you.